Welcome to this edition of Health First. Today, we will hear from Dr. Ed Mahan with our cardiology clinic here at CRMC. Stay tuned. Yeah, I'm going to talk today about understanding your heart, and we'll talk about vitamins too, and also we'll talk a little bit about heart failure. Um, I'm Dr. Ed Mahan. February is National Heart Month, um, and that's why, that's why I'm here today. Uh, and on, the, on, on Friday, on the February 7th, was the Go Red Day uh, per the American Heart Association, which was to increase awareness of women and heart disease. And that's what that little pin is there that, that you might see some people wearing. So what is heart disease? It's any type of uh, heart, any kind of disease that affects the heart, also known as cardiovascular disease, uh, which can be heart disease, which can be strokes. And the way this, this, this forms is that the one has plaques form and grow on the inside of the heart arteries and they eventually, they're made up of fat and cholesterol and they eventually um, narrow the artery and once they get over about 70, 75 percent then they can start causing problems like chest pain, angina, problems like that and that's generally when you'll, you'll, you'll see someone like me. Um, if, that, if that plaque then ruptures, then it can cause a blood clot, which is a heart attack, and, um, and then you also see someone like me. This is a picture of how that works. On the left side, there's a picture of the heart, and that artery is the left anterior descending on the front part of the heart, and there's a, a cross section of the artery, the blue line showing the, um, blue line showing the um, blood flow going down the heart artery. This is the plaque that we were talking about here. And in a heart attack, that plaque ruptures, and then a blood clot forms over that, which then stops the blood flow from going down that artery, and then one gets chest pain, and, and then we do things such as the angiograms and, and, uh, and stents. Now, why is it important to learn about uh, coronary artery disease? It's the leading cause of death and it's a leading cause of death in Coleman, in Alabama, in the United States, and, and pretty much anywhere in the westernized world that eats its diets that are similar to ours. Um, these are other common uh, forms of, of, of death, cancer, emphysema or COPD, Alzheimer's disease or dementia, and accidents, but heart disease or CAD, it, it causes more deaths than all of these together. That's how common it is. Now, uh, the heart, this is the, the um, um, Heart Disease Awareness uh, Month, and again, American Heart Association Go Red. Uh, heart disease is a special, uh, special concern for women because it's under-recognized in women. Women often have symptoms that aren't similar to, to what men have, and so women are often unaware when they're having a heart problem or if they present to the emergency room, they might not even think that the first problem that they're having is something to do with their heart. It could be something to do with their abdomen, with their lungs, or something like that. And heart disease is thought of as a man's disease, um, but actually more women have heart attacks than men have heart attacks. And then again, February is the American Heart, Asso heart Association Go Red Month. Now, the, these are the risk factors for heart disease and hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, family history of, of early heart disease, smoking, and the American Heart Association added this one on last November, which is stroke. Um, and then in women, again, there's special concerns which can make them more at risk for having heart disease, and those are obesity, uh, sedentary lifestyle, which lack of exercise, and early menopause. Uh, and these heart risk factors uh, play a bigger role in women and their metabolic syndrome, which has to do with uh, the adipose or fat tissue around the abdomen, uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, and high triglycerides. Also risk factors for heart disease that are especially pro troublesome in women, mental stress and depression. And the problem with these two is that if you have these, it makes it hard to to follow a correct lifestyle or even to take medicines, you know, like, like one should be doing. Uh, smoking, so of course that should stop and that should never get started. And, um, and low levels of estrogen also are, is a risk factor for heart disease, especially after menopause. And there's some controversy about hormone replacement treatment because it can cause breast cancer risk, so it just depends on what, the, what, the, what one's age is, you know, when that, when that, uh, when that um, menopause happens and what, uh, and what age one would be where one would use these uh, heart hormone replacement uh, therapies. Now is heart disease something that only 
older people should worry about, and the answer to that is no. Anyone that's less than 65 but has a family history of heart disease, you know, should be, should be, should be concerned if they start having symptoms, which we'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes here. Any diabetic, and really anyone that's probably more than about 30 years old should, uh, should be aware if they're having those kind of symptoms. Uh, menopause increases the risk of heart disease. And again, the American Heart Association, go red. So this is uh, the, heart, the usual heart attack symptoms are, as shown in the picture over here, um, chest pain. Um, pain can radiate to the left arm, can radiate to the neck, uh, to the back. Um, but in, in women, they can just have these symptoms uh, separate, such as neck, shoulder, upper back or abdominal pain, uh, shortness of breath, uh, nausea, vomiting, indigestion, sweating, lightheadedness or dizziness. And actually about, uh, I think it's been about two weeks ago, we saw someone in the emergency room here with a heart attack and all they had was, um, they had shortness of breath. And I think a month ago we had someone that all they had was this, nausea and vomiting and nothing else. Now, in women, um, heart attack symptoms can be subtle. And oftentimes women show up in the emergency room and the damage from the heart attack has already been done because they didn't think that the symptoms they were having had anything to do with their heart. Uh, women have a tendency for the small arteries of the heart to block. And this is a, a model of the heart arteries and I'm talking about these little arteries down in here. And usually when stents and things are done, they're usually done on the bigger arteries like these ones here. So how does, how does one reduce the risk of heart disease? It's usually lifestyle changes, and that, usually, and that means exercising per the American Heart Association for 30 to 60 minutes, and that's every day, to maintain a healthy weight, and that generally, I mean, usually healthy weight means that one looks thin, too. Um, um, that if you, if, you, if you watch those old World War II um, documentaries and you see the people walking around and how they look, that's generally how, you know, that's supposed to be a healthy weight. Um, anyway, quit smoking and of course never start is the best way. Uh, and then a diet that's low in saturated fat, cholesterol and salt. Uh, also, you know, to take medicines and supplements as they're prescribed. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids is another American Heart Association uh, recommendation, especially after a heart attack. And these ones are nose, and that's vitamin E at uh, a dose of over, say, about 200 units daily, beta carotene, um, and folic acid at a, at a higher dose, not at a lower dose like it would be in a multivitamin. And this is also important, too, and that's a flu shot because that decreases inflammation and decreases one's risk of having a heart, having a heart attack. So this is, an, this is an American College of Cardiology guideline, flu shots. Okay, now this is the, um, this is the second part here. We're going to talk about heart failure. It's also known as congestive heart failure, fluid on the lungs, and long ago it was known as this, dropsy. Uh, and it's what is, the heart muscle doesn't pump blood as well as it should. And one should realize that if one has heart failure, that it's a lifelong disease and it's not going to go away. So one just can't stop taking their medicines, taking their therapies, watching their fluids and everything. It's a lifelong disease. Uh, the scope of heart failure in the United States, 5 million Americans have heart failure. There's 500,000 new cases that are diagnosed every year. It costs. 25 to 50 billion dollars a year to care for it, and there's six and a half million hospital days per year that are, that are um, dedicated to heart failure. There's 300,000 deaths a year from heart failure also. That's in the United States. And these are some of the symptoms of heart failure, and they're, they're pretty general. Um, shortness of breath, swelling of the legs, um, chronic lack of energy, difficulty sleeping at night because one short of breath, uh, swollen um, abdomen, uh, cough, increased urination at night because of all the retained fluid, and sometimes uh, even confusion can be a, a symptom of uh, heart failure. Um, this on the left is a, is a heart that, uh, it's not a normal heart, it's a, the, the walls of the heart here of the left ventricle are very thick it should look more like, uh, kind of more like this here, but 
what ends up happening, we get high blood pressure, the heart walls thicken, and then eventually as the disease goes on, the heart starts to dilate or enlarge and these heart walls start to thin out. And one might not have symptoms at this stage, but usually one will have symptoms at that stage when the heart starts to dilate. And this is a chest x-ray of someone, um, of a normal on the left, and that's right here. And that's a normal sized heart. And then on the right is when that heart starts to thin and starts to dilate and then the heart starts to enlarge. And sometimes we'll see patients just based on an enlarged heart and no other symptoms. Now just so, you can, so you've heard these terms, but the types of heart failure there are, there's left-sided heart failure, uh, right-sided heart failure, where the fluid backs up in the lungs and right-sided heart failure can also back up in the stomach. Systolic heart failure, which has to do with that heart muscle uh, being weak. And this is a newer one, diastolic heart failure, where the heart muscle can have, you can have a normal, called an ejection fracture, the heart muscle function can be normal. But what happens here is the heart muscle becomes stiff, and that's usually because of long-term hypertension, or sometimes even just aging can cause that. Now there's a lot of different causes of heart, of, uh, heart failure, um, from, from heart disease to um, heart attacks, high blood pressure is a common one, heart valve leakage, uh, damaged heart muscle, they call that cardiomyopathy, uh, myocarditis, even from viruses. Um, when I first moved here from California, when I, even when I was sick, I used to go out and run, and then one of our heart failure doctors uh, said that if you did that, this virus might then attack your heart muscle and cause heart muscle damage. So I stopped it after that. Um, heart birth defects, congenital heart disease, the holes in the heart are common upper and lower part of the heart, abnormal heart rhythms, arrhythmias, uh, atrial fibrillation is a common kind of a rhythm problem and if that heart, if that one has that heart rhythm problem and the heart rate is fast and it's not controlled, that can also weaken the heart muscle too. So sometimes just putting one on a medicine that slows the heart rate down, um, that can cause the heart muscle to become stronger. And then other diseases, diabetes, thyroid problems, COPD or emphysema, sleep apnea, Iron pro these aren't so common, iron problems. Alcohol is another one that can cause it. And the nice thing about, is if there's a good thing about an alcohol problem, if one has a weak heart muscle because of alcoholism and then one stops drinking, within a year, one's, heart, one's uh, heart muscle can return back to normal, where it's not such the case, so much the case with some of these other things. Um, and then this is an amyloidosis. This is a, another uncommon kind of problem. Now these are the six ways to stay healthy, and you follow these tips, do what your doctor says, and you can stay healthy. This is supposed to be the fountain of youth here. Okay. I thought that was kind of a neat slide. Um, so the six ways, six ways to stay healthy. Uh, take your medicines as the doctor orders. Make sure you go to the doctor appointments. Um, you have to monitor those symptoms like was in that picture. Monitor weight. The diet has to be changed generally and also fluids have to be watched. I don't know how many patients I see that come in and, and they think that they should be drinking at least eight cups of fluid a day and that's more, more for a healthy person. That's not for a person that has heart failure. Um, exercise and that oftentimes has to be directed by the doctor because if one's heart muscle is very weak, then the amount of exercise that we would want the person to do would be much less than if one had a strong heart muscle. And then, of course, alcohol has to be limited, and if one has a weak heart muscle, that actually has to be eliminated. And a lot of pa some patients I see take kind of exception to this one. And, um, and tobacco should be stopped, and there's really no good reason to do that, no matter what you have, actually. And then caffeine probably it should be limited, too. So again, take medications as ordered. Uh, the medications for heart failure are necessary, and even if you feel well. So in other words, if, if you start to feel well, you can't stop taking the medicines. Because again, like I said earlier, you know, it's a lifelong disease, and, and it's just not going to go away. You have to take the medicines. So one should go over the medication list with the doctor or the nurse. Um, understand how and when to take your medicines, and therefore the clock. Because uh, that's important. Sometimes the, 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 the medical regimens taking uh, heart failure medicines can be very kind of complicated. Um, some of the medicines might need to be taken three or four times a day. And then also one should ask about the side effects of medications and what their interactions are. Because once one starts taking over about five medications, usually there's going to be some kind of an interaction. 
um, should know how to refill the medicines. We see this not infrequently. We give them an initial uh, prescription and then they come back on their next visit and they haven't refilled their medicine. They thought they just had to take it one time and, and they were cured. Um, and, and also make sure you call your doctor's office a few days before you run out uh, because you know Christmas Eve at midnight is probably not the best time to call us to get your medicines. Um, um, make sure you can get your medicines and you can get to the pharmacy. And if you can't do it, you know, some family member or some friend, you know, could help. Um, and then uh, bring your medicines when you come to the clinic or, or an accurate list, because sometimes these lists aren't, sometimes these lists aren't very accurate. Um, um, and then tell your doctor if there's any kind of side effects or any problems that you're having, because they could potentially be side effects. So keep the doctor appointments. As heart failure, oftentimes it's not a simple problem. Uh, the doctor needs to see you to keep you well. And uh, I saw this on a, on a talk on YouTube, and I thought it was kind of an interesting thing. The, a boring clinic visit is much better than an exciting emergency room visit, okay? <laughs> so that's why we want to see you here. And even if you come in and you say, I don't know why I'm here. I'm not having any problems. Why did you, you know, because of the, we want to avoid this, okay? Um, so the doctor's appointments, bring a family, member, friend. Uh, even yesterday there was a patient that I saw in the clinic and their husband was sitting out in the waiting room. Let them come in, you know, because we can, sometimes they'll hear things that, that you don't hear. Uh, they might have questions that you don't have. Bring all your medicines or medicine list to all the visits and make sure you do this. Um, and also what one should do if they have heart failure, they should monitor the symptoms and wait. And actually any kind of problem, hypertension even, is, is, is the same sort of thing. And some of the heart failure symptoms we already talked about, shortness of breath, swell, swelling, uh, or even just weakness and tiredness. Uh, when one monitors the weight, extra, you know, extra fluid usually is extra weight. I mean, we had a patient even in the, we have in the hospital, we put in the hospital yesterday, gained about I think it was 22 pounds over the last two weeks, and um, and they're, now they're in the hospital. And they and 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 they're you know when one gains weight, they're supposed to you know let us know that so we can you know do some sort sort of medic medication change or, or diet change, and um, and they didn't do that. Um, and then weight gains can start a couple weeks, two weeks before even one even has symptoms. So so a weight weight gain should really be looked on as an early kind of warning system. Um, coming from the military, the AWACS, is that what we used to call that? Um, uh, and one should weigh every day so that one can prevent these, these kind of problems from happening, the extra weight. Um, and then, um, again, one should have a scale. Um, make sure you can read the numbers, because some of the scales will have really big numbers, so as the vision gets worse, one can still read those numbers. And then write the numbers down and then bring the chart with you when you come to the doctor visits. That's important so that we can do something about what you have. Uh, should weigh yourself the same time each morning um, after, after you use the bathroom, before taking medicines such as the diuretics, uh, before breakfast or drinking fluids because these things can cause your weight to go up and make sure you're, you know, you're wearing the same clothes. Because I mean, clothes make a difference. I mean, uh, we have some patients that come in and they take their jacket off one visit because, you know, they say, look, I lost five pounds, but when they come back the next time, it won't be like that. <laughs> okay? So, um, and again, call your doctor if you gain three pounds of, of, of weight in one day or you gain five pounds of weight in one week. Have I set this to... It's getting away from me here. Um, but anyway, so by monitoring symptoms of weight, um, one will, again, live longer, feel better, spend less time in the hospital. Uh, salt, that's um, sodium, and the more, one, more salt one takes in, the more fluid one retains, so that has to be limited. And extra fluid then causes swelling, it's misspelled, and, and then heart failure symptoms. Um, so if one restricts salt, then one has less swelling and one should be more healthy. The easiest way to restrict salt is just don't add it to the diet. I mean, you can put it into the food when, when it's being cooked, but just don't add it to the diet. And one teaspoon of, of salt equals 2,300 milligrams of salt. And salt is generally limited. We usually limit it to about 2 or 2.4 milligrams of, or uh, 2 grams of salt a day. 
So you should know how much salt's in your food. So if someone else is preparing, preparing the food, you should know what they're putting into it. You should ask. Now these are common food salt sources, canned foods, frozen dinners, deli meats, and hot dogs. So these are other food salt sources. Sea salt, even it seems to be a popular thing these days, but it has, it's still salt. And salad dressing has a lot of salt in it too. I was looking at one of the labels yesterday after I put this together, and it, it does have a lot of salt in it also. Cheeses, soy sauce, pickles, like we use in football when, we, when our kids start having cramps. Um, uh, French fries, sausage, bratwurst, ham, bacon, and uh, tomatoes that are in jars and pasta. So if one eats out, one should try to pick healthy foods, and generally baked or broiled foods are the best. And if one's going to have salad dressing, sauce, or gravy, that should be put onto the side so you can regulate you know, how much of that you have after you taste it to see how salty it is. And generally safe dishes are bacon or fish, steamed vegetables are usually good. Um, avoid salt licks, okay? Um, I was going to put on something, but it was a little more racy, and I was told I couldn't put that on, so I had to do this one. So, um, okay, watch the salt intake. And if you avoid salt, you, again, live longer, feel better, less time in the hospital. Okay, fluid restriction. Usually, fluid has to be limited in someone that has heart failure. Eight eight-ounce glasses a day uh, is, eight, is two quarts. But oftentimes, when, when patients show me how big their, their glasses they're drinking are, they're much bigger than eight ounces. Yeah, like that. Right, right. And, um, and an eight ounce glass is pretty small, so you can only have, so if one's going to have the eight glasses a day, it should be the eight ounces, not 16 or 32 or bigger, you know, uh, jar, uh, glasses. Uh, liquid food equals fluid, so that's the same, so same thing. So in other words, yogurt equals fluid, jello equals fluid, ice cream, pudding. Um, fruits that have liquid, uh, ha one orange or even a half grapefruit, that equals four ounces of fluid. And all those need to be counted when one has, one has heart, heart failure or one is restricting their fluid intake. Um, try to space out the fluids over the day so you're not drinking everything in the morning then you're, then you're thirsty the whole day. Uh, save fluid so you can take it with your medicines and applesauce can be used instead of uh, a regular fluid. If one is thirsty, um, Ice chips can be used, uh, frozen juice in an ice tray, popsicles, uh, rinsing the mouth with water, a lemon, lemon wedge, gum, hard candy, strawberries, even frozen grapes to help, help one feel less thirsty. Exercise, and again, that, that amount of exercise is usually determined by the doctor because if one has a very weak heart muscle, then one should not be doing you know, very strenuous exercise. That can precipitate um, problems. Uh, but in general, it's a safe and it's a healthy thing. I guess that's exercise they're doing there. Um, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine use should be limited. Alcohol can be okay, but again, if one has a very weak heart muscle or the, and oftentimes I'm having patients stop their alcohol when they have uh, um, cardiomyopathies or weak heart muscles, heart failure. So we can see if that's what's part of the cause of the problem. But generally, um, less than two drinks a day for, uh, for men, less than one drink a day per woman. That's just really usually based on the size of, of, of the patient. Uh, caffeine in moderation is okay, less than two cups a day usually. Although if one has other problems, you know, acid reflux, palpitations, problems like that, usually we, we take it off. If one's smoking, it needs to stop. You're not going to be able to give me a good reason for that. Doesn't matter what you say. Um, um, yeah, that has to stop. And I grew up with smoking parents that eventually stopped when they almost died, but you know, they, they did stop. Um, it makes the work, heart work harder, and it makes you more short of breath, which is this is we're trying to get this better when we treat heart failure. And smoking works against that. So again, these are the six ways to stay healthy. Take medicines as ordered, go to the doctor appointments, monitor the symptoms, monitor the weight, uh, adapt the diet and fluids, exercise as directed, and limit alcohol, get rid of tobacco, and limit caffeine. Now, is there a typical prognosis if you have either heart disease or heart failure? And the answer to that is no. It's an individual problem. So, um, and what we usually do is we customize a plan it, based on what you have. You know, um, whether you have bad high blood pressure, you have a problem with taking in too many fluids, smoking, those sort of things. And the outcome is not necessarily bleak, 
Um, and usually there's something we can do. I mean, I just saw a man in the hospital or in the clinic just before I walked in here. He's 90 years old and he needs to have a procedure done, which will likely help him quite a bit um, as far as how he feels. And he's 90 years old. Um, now, so one is generally never too old. You know, there's usually something we can, you know, we can find to help generally. And this is the part on the vitamins. This is a short part. So if you just have to read, this is an editorial from the Annals of, the Internal, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. And this kind of summarizes it. Enough is enough. Stop wasting money on vitamins and mineral supplements. And this was, last, this was December 17th of last year. So the, um, the US Preventative Services Task Force uh, determined if there's no nutritional deficiencies, and they looked at three trials of multivitamins 24 trials of single or paired vitamins, and 400,000 patients. Now, my son was telling me there's a, and there's a, there's a, a, a talk show host on the radio that, that, um, that he just blow, you know, tries to blast this one, but I don't, you know, I listen to him some too, but I don't see how you can, I mean, 400,000 patients. And this is what they conclude. There's no clear evidence of a beneficial effect. And that's, again, if there's no nutritional deficiencies, if, if one is able to eat a normal type diet, so it doesn't, it doesn't help mortality, cardiovascular disease, or cancer, none of those. And that's one of the studies. There's three of them here in this, this part of this. Then there was the Physician's Health Study 2. This was almost 6,000 patients over 12 years, so a lot of patients. And they found that multivitamins didn't help the, the thinking or cognitive performance or memory for things like dementia. So again, if one has a... a, a um, a non-deficient diet. And then the final one, and chelation therapy has been a thing over the years, you know, we've heard about it. They do it, there's someone that does it in Birmingham, and there's never really been any good evidence that it helps as far as heart disease, but part of this study, they had, they had uh, 17, 1,700 uh, men and women followed for almost five years, and they had a 28-component multivitamin. And they found there was no significant difference in cardiovascular events, which would be heart attacks, um, uh, stroke, compared with placebo. So that in other words, it doesn't, doesn't really do any good. So their conclusion was beta, uh, no, this is my, part of my conclusion, part theirs. Uh, beta carotene, vitamin E, and vitamin E in high doses can actually cause heart failure. I mean, so that one has to be careful about that. I mean, you can take it, but it should be less than 200 units, 200 units or less a day. Um, and possibly even high, high doses of vitamin A. So if one takes a multivitamin, generally these things are going to be in low doses, and that's okay. It's not going to harm you. But, um, but the high doses of these can be harmful. Uh, other antioxidants, uh, folic acid, B vitamins, multivitamins, mineral supplements are ineffective. That was their conclusion. And they said this again, enough is enough. And, the first, and they said this too, which don't see very often, further studies would be futile. So now a little bit about uh, here, at, here at Coleman. I've been here since like last, uh, last October. Uh, Dr. Lee has been here, he told me, 15 years. Dr. Papa Pietro has been here uh, off and on, I think more than 20 years. And now um, uh, he's here, uh, he's been here probably 60% of the time now for the last about year and a half. And I, I'm here, I'm here full time and I've been here for, um, since last October. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Health First, where we heard from Dr. Ed Mahan with the CRMC Cardiology Clinic. If you would like more information on this or any other Health First show, please feel free to call us at 256-737-2600 or visit us online at crmchospital.com.